Can't you? Do you want this one? No, it's fine. I'll do this. Okay, cool. That's great. Um, yeah, so my name is Colin. I'm a gastroenterologist. I'm very much a general gastroenterologist. It's lovely to sit in an audience like this and hear the, um, the, sort of the intricacies and nuances of quite a lot of stuff that I probably occupy about four to five percent of my gastroenterology practice. I do a lot of scopes. I do a lot of upper scopes, a lot of lower scopes, and here are some and a lot of functional disease. Um, so I've yet to see the functional disease uh, chat. Read kind of to my time, so I can't speak for an hour, so I'm going to speak for a little bit less than that. Just quickly before we start, um, who's got the intention of moving over to private? Because I actually did it. So I'm going to get to one of me. So who's got the intention? Hands up. Guys, it's the end of the day. You might as well use your hands a bit. Well, it's not a matter of who's got the intention, it's a matter of there's no other option. 100%, so that was where I was getting to. And obviously, you guys moving into private, but I take it that the HPV guys are probably clustered around there. You're, going to, you're quite a favorite surgical um, theaters and obviously doing scopes, but the gastroenterologists, yeah, the medical gastroenterologists moving into private, unfortunately need to make money, so they have to be obviously scope, and that's probably where a lot of their cash is going to come from. You don't necessarily make a lot of money by seeing patients, you make a lot of money by doing a lot of endoscopy. So it's absolutely imperative that right now, although this isn't examinable in the next couple of weeks, this is a very, very important thing to start thinking about, because I didn't think about it. I thought I had a couple of business ideas in my mind, but suddenly on day one, um, uh, things were slightly different. So title of sort of how to set up an endoscopy center, let's start by asking the question why, because it's a lot of work and you need to wrap your head around it and you need to be able to wake up in the morning and realize why you're going to put that effort in um, to actually get an endoscopy unit um, going that suits you, uh, suits your pockets and, and ultimately suits your patients if that's the way you're on time. So if you Google it and you look at a couple of articles, um, setting up an endoscopy unit requires planning, knowledge of legislation, meticulous attention to detail, realistic goals. The only thing out of that really is the fact that it is probably a three-year concept um, from, from idea to move, and I probably agree with that. It does require some teamwork, but at the end of the day it requires a couple of other things. It requires luck, and it requires luck because it all depends on where you are posted, and I'll try and explain that a little bit now. It requires relationships. Um, so you, I mean, you, we all have relationships with our patients, but ultimately it requires relationships with your colleagues, and most importantly with hospital management. It requires money, so you need someone to help you, unless you're a trust fund kid, which I'm not. Um, and it requires patience and patience. So, well, my background is, um, I, I, I studied at Fritzke, if you guys don't know. Um, the office that I used was, you kind of sit on the left there. Um, art was cushy. I mean, I used to rock up at work, a uh, little bit of a ward round that my intern did. I used to complain about something, maybe I'd pop up to go see the patients, run downstairs, see a couple of patients, clinic done by 11, and then we went to go shoot the breeze for a while. Um, and on certain days I did scopes, and the scopes were rad because uh, you walked into a scope unit, you had highly trained endoscopy nurses most of the time. You had patients that didn't know your name. You had patients that you didn't really know why you were scoping, but you both said and said you were told to scope them because it was your list. And when you put out your hand and you asked for a steer, you got it. You didn't really need to know what steer you got. You got what they had. You got a biopsy corset that they had. And then when you took off the pilot and it started to pour blood, you would call Dion or you would call Adam. Um, and that was great. You know, very cush. The difference is that then suddenly you grow up and you graduate and you pass your exam and then you move to a place like this. So this is Life Kingsbury Hospital. Um, this is a private hospital in the southern suburbs. One would expect that sort of um, southern suburbs hospitals that um, they would have a high quality endoscopy centre. Um, you would expect to come into sort of like this amazing unit with great nursing staff, etc. Um, but that's not the case. So when I started at Kingsbury Hospital, I asked for um, a place to do my endoscopy. They used to have an old endoscopy unit that got kicked out with radiology earned the more money, so the radiologists went downstairs. And then they gave me the, the, the crappy theatre at the back. And it really was that. It was like the dingy darkroom theatre. There was a theatre bed, there was an anaesthetic machine, and outside there were two um, older than this 170 and 190 stacks. 
lots of scratches on the screen, the equipment was obviously in the corner, and, um, and then crap on, you, that's it, you have to go ahead. So how do you book a patient in the theater? How do you set up a list? You know, these things that medical gastroenterologists don't know. The one thing about theater as well is that it's actually quite a scary place for us physicians. I mean, physicians don't go to theater. It's very foreign, it's foreign equipment. And every time you find a polyp and you turn to your endoscopy nurse and you say, um, you know, snare please, they look at you and they have no clue what a snare is. And you actually end up starting to do things um, very defensively because you realize that the staff are taken through, they used to opening um, sort of operating kits and operating, but the staff actually don't really know what they're doing. And that's when I think sort of basic endoscopy even becomes a little bit hazardous. You've also got um, a surgical bed, which is great. It's very maneuverable, but it's thin. It's very really difficult to roll patients. You know, I went into private thinking that you're going to um, sedate patients yourself with a bit of midazolam and fentanyl. Um, you know, it doesn't really necessarily work that way if you're scoping with theater. Theater is not as, um, not also a comfortable place for the patients. So, you know, these patients are being wheeled around. Then you put them in theater and they're awake and there's buzzing and they can smell weird things. And patients just don't like that. So you have to kind of change your mindset as well. Um, and, um, and you also have to realize that there are probably a lot of people around you, in Ethiopia specifically, that can do jobs better than you, and the Medicaid will pay for it. And that's something that you have to think about. What am I willing to do? Who can do it better than me? And if so, can I farm it out so that ultimately the patient gets the better outcome? Um, I don't point to this out to me because I think I'm worried about this a lot, um, going into private. But one of the best things, though, was the fact that I became um, sort of a, a socialite in the tea room. In between cases, you would pop into the tea room, um, had your coffee, had something to eat because they, they, they pay for it for you, and you actually get to chat to people. And that's very important in private because if you're stuck in your room and you're scoping in your room, you don't chat to anyone. It becomes quite lonely. You build up mates, build up friendships, you meet the surgeons, you meet the guys that barely are in trouble, which is really good. And also kickstarts a healthy sort of referral um, um, sort of lineage for you in your practice if they like you. If they don't like you, then I'm not for it. So, yeah, so I understand the move to sort of an endoscopic unit out of theatre. You ask, well, why then? But the important thing is that at the end of the day, you've got a time span in your life and you're going to do a certain number of scopes and you're going to wake up when you get to 55 retirement age, if that's what you want to retire at. And some guy's going to say to you, did you bill for the TI biopsy code? And you're going to turn and say, what do you mean? No, no, discovery pays for when you biopsy the terminal island, they'll probably pay 500 bucks. Yeah, you taught, you taught me that, yeah. The issue is that you're going to wake up and someone is going to tell you this, and you're going to turn back and you're going to say, for 20 years I've been going into the terminal island, and I've been taking biopsies, and I haven't billed that code. And then you're suddenly going to realize how much money you've potentially lost. And I think what ends up happening is that, is that you kind of sort of self-monitor and making sure that you are billing appropriately, you're maximizing the billing so you can earn, so that one day when you get to retirement, you're not sort of, sort of stuck with that sinking thought that for 20 years you actually haven't billed for something that you've been doing and that they will pay for. So to understand costing is very, very important. It's also important that you can sleep well at night, knowing that you aren't overcharging. Um, and that's why it's important to understand the whole sort of entity of theater costs and in-room endoscopy costs. Basically, theater costs are important because they're hospital costs that the patient gets billed or the medical aid gets billed. They're endoscopic costs, and there's obviously an anesthetic cost that you're going to use in the anesthetist, which I've turned to do now. Um, the reason I'm using an anesthetist is actually I became quite defensive in practicing. Um, and you realize quite quickly that if a patient has an airway issue um, or complication, you have to be able to defend yourself. And chatting to the anesthetist in the tea room, the minute you start mixing your midazolam and fentanyl, your uh, maximum required, your maximum allowed doses of those two become really, really low. And um, when you've got 10 anesthetists around you in the theater, um, there's not much left to stand on if you have, a, if you have an airway problem. Um, so I think it's very important to also just wrap that concept around with yourself as well. Theatre costs are important because patients, if you're booking lists in theatre, patients have an admission fee. 
Then there's a cost to the a cost to the patients, a theatre cost, which can sometimes run to about I think it's now about 220 rand per minute. Adam might might know that a bit better than me. Which is a bit of a problem if you it's not I mean it's a problem in general, but if you do a 15 minute colonoscopy, that's not a problem. But if you're doing a really difficult colonoscopy that you're turning and twisting and it's getting stuck in corners and it takes you 45 minutes, an hour even, you know, those costs can rack up significantly. So what hospitals, um, hospitals have entered agreements with medical aids to try and make sort of this co-payment fee where they basically say, okay, you're going to be admitted for colonoscopy, therefore you must pay 7,000 Rand or 5,000 Rand and we'll use that in a bundle. Which, isn't, which, which kind of makes a bit of sense. The only problem is that a lot of medical aids don't actually pay that. It usually comes out of patient savings. Um, and if the patient is on a poor plan, then it comes out of patient pocket. Um, so at the end of the day, it means that a patient who's paying for medical aid ends up not actually um, getting the service of the medical aid because it's being done in the theatre. And with 